Hello and welcome to whiskey.com where fine spirits meet and today I'm here in the north side of the space side in the city of Elgin. Elgin is part of Moray that's already taken a bit from what we'll see today. Elgin is a small city with 23,000 inhabitants and kind of the capital of Moray because it's the biggest city. Where I'm exactly here is the Elgin Cathedral and it's one of the monuments of Elgin and also the best ruin or best monument for the mid-ages in northern Scotland. The cathedral was built in, 12th, uh, in, the 12th century, in the 13th century in 1224 and it's actually a Catholic cathedral. So um, in 1560 the cathedral lost its roof probably due to um, Someone set it ablaze because uh, the English church just got reformed from Catholicism to English Reformed Church, so Protestants. So the, the Catholics were pretty much the, yeah, the bad guys. So they set this, uh, the cathedral ablaze. Uh, one of the towers eventually collapsed, but two of the towers are pretty, still in pretty good shape. And um, you can actually walk onto them. So the cathedral over the time took its toll, but uh, now they renovated it a bit. Uh, the, the lawn looks really good and there are a lot of graves and these graves can be really, really, really old. So there's a lot of history in this place. So if you ever come to Elgin, this is a must for Elgin. Um, but today we're not going to focus on the cathedral, but we're going to have a look at Glen Moray. Yes, Moray, the Shire, has a, dis a distillery that is called Glen Moray, and we're going to have a look at this distillery today. Let's talk a bit about the history and the founding of the distillery. Robert Fawns and Son in 1887. Uh, founded a brewery here on site and they actually brewed beer. Ten years later they converted the brewery into a distillery. So that was the birth time for the Glen Moray distillery and that was 1897 which you can find on the bottle. It, the distillery had a bit of a, a rough start. So they got closed a lot, they got sold and reopened and they were on and off pretty often so they got closed in uh, 1910 and then they got bought by McDonald's and Muir and they reopened the distillery they knew how to manage a distillery and they built the distillery to a, yeah, a good working distillery. In 1958 there was a big turn uh, turnaround in the distillery. They actually rebuilt a lot and they decommissioned the malting floors and uh, built new Saladin boxes which was a pretty new technology for that time and uh, they actually decommissioned them in 78 so yeah and now they get their mold from outside molding from the big companies which has a, a really good quality. Uh, the last thing that was uh, mentionable in the history was they got sold to La Martiniquez, uh, a French company, spirits company, actually the biggest spirits company in France in terms of volume. And um, that is a, a mutually beneficial relationship between the mother company and the distillery because the mother company now has a really good single malt brand in their portfolio and the distillery gets a lot of good casks from their mother company. The company has uh, access to good casks from their French islands in the Caribbean, rum casks, and then they have a few other casks like wine casks and that kind of stuff. So the French really are into casks, so the distillery benefits a lot from that. Now let's talk a bit about the logo because it has a lot of symbolism going on. Um, the logo is divided into four parts. The top left here is um, uh, barley and the barley represents the uh, ingredients for the distillery. It's single malt so there's only malted barley that's going into the Glenmore single malt. And then the top right we have a beehive and the beehive represents the flavor and the, the character of Glenmore single malt. It's supposed to be uh, sweet, creamy, 
yeah, and a really nice, pleasant flavor, which is, yeah, what we know of Glen Murray. Then the bottom left is the cask. The cask is a very important step for making the whiskey. It, um, the maturation gives the, the whiskey a lot of character. So this is one of the most important things for a Scottish single malt. So it's on, on the uh, logo there. And the uh, bottom right is a ship. And the ship represents the, uh, the exporting of the whiskey. Um, the whiskey is, was exported through Lossiemouth. Lossiemouth is a small town at the coast, at the um, North Shore. And they used to ship the whiskey up there and the ships would export them into the world. The town Lossiemouth gets its name from the river Lossie that's right behind me. And the Lossie supplies the distillery with fresh water and not just water for the mesh tun, but also for the cooling inside the production. Um, the, there are disadvantages and advantages if you have a big river flowing next to you. The advantage is that you never run out of water. The distillery never sh uh, had any shortages of water in their lifetime. The disadvantage is there is flooding. So the distillery had a lot of flooding in their history. And even in 2009, there was so, such a high flooding that barrels that were stored on site were flooding all around the distillery and even flooding down the river. So yeah, now the distillery has built some dams and some walls and uh, now the problem should really be contained. Now our clear water from the river is combined with grist, with barley grist in the mash tun. The grist is produced by yeah, coarsely milling malt, malted barley. And this is done by a very old um, portier's malt mill. And actually the conveyor and the, the system, the hoppers, they are also built by portiers. I didn't know that before. But this equipment is really, really old. It's, there's a lot of wood involved and yeah, very, very old and very stylish equipment. It ends up here in the mash tun. It's a stainless steel mash tun. It's very new, energy efficient, and the water is combined, uh, the grist is combined with 40,000 liters of water. And during the mashing process, it is very important to have the right temperatures. There are enzymes within the grist that uh, convert the starch into sugar. The plant wants to convert the starch into sugar to then convert it into cellulosis and have the corn growing, the, the, the barley, the actual plant. But we only want to convert the starch into sugar because the sugar is the best substance for the yeast to produce the alcohol that is later then used in the whiskey. Um, the mashing is done in, in three mashes. The first mash is 40,000 liters, the second one is 20,000 liters, and when they are drained, the draft, that's what, what's left in there, the draft, has still 5,000 liters of um, sugary water in it, so there's only 55,000 liters going off into the fermentation. The third mashing has also 40,000 liters, and this, is, um, this can't be used for the fermentation because it only contains very little sugar and, um, and starch um, in it. Um, therefore, you pump it in a separate tank and use it in the next batch as the first water. This is very good because it, it brings out the efficiency and the most of uh, everything inside this process. With this sugary substance, we go off to the fermentation. After the mash done, we're going into the fermentation. Yeah. This is where the mash gets hit with the yeast and then the alcoholic fermentation hits. Um, that turns the sugar into CO2 and alcohol. Um, the fermentation is so big, the wash bags are so big at Glen Moray that they have actually have to put them outside. Behind me you see the eight big wash bags that are the new wash bags. 
There are two tanks in front that don't belong to the wash bags. They're just storage tanks for the third mashing or for the finished uh, wash that is being feeded into the still. And um, the actual fermentation in the tanks takes about 65 hours and you end up with a beer of roughly 8.5 to 8.9 percent ABV. Um, they have eight of the big wash bags with 55,000 liters of volume. They still have their old wash bags, six, six wash bags of about half the size and they use them as if they were three big wash bags. So they always fill two at a time. So here at the distillery they say they have 11 big wash bags. Yeah. After the wash bag, it goes off into the wash still. So I'm here with the wash stills. Uh, back in the days when Horst visited the distillery, he was, uh, the distillery only had four stills, two wash stills, two spirit stills. That was back in 95, 96. So whiskey.com pretty much a long time had the wrong numbers, the old numbers of four stills, because the distillery now has a lot more stills. Three wash stills, six spirit stills. They're in a different place. And the spirit stills are pretty big. They are 17,000 liters in volume, which is huge. And the distillery can actually produce six million liters of pure alcohol per year, which is incredible. And uh, when you look at the character of the whiskey, uh, Glenmore Glen is a space cider and it's very fruity and mild. If you look at the shape of the still, then it's very wide and very straight. So usually that, that gives you a rough new make. And also the, the time to distill it, they're not distilling slow, they're distilling really, really fast because you want to have the output. But uh, so how come they can have such a, a fruity, mild character? And that's because uh, the wash still, the first distillation, it really not depends, it really is not dependent on uh, the, the flavor does not depend on the first stills. So it doesn't have much influence on the raw spirit. The spirit still has a lot of influence on the character and that's what we're going to have a look next. But what I want to tell you here is um, this here back behind me is the condenser. It takes the water, alcohol, vapors, puts them back, back into a liquid. But there is a second column that goes up. And what does that do? That's actually a heat exchanger or a heat rejuvenator or yeah, it brings back the heat. And um, that is really, really interesting because this insulation here has um, increases the energy efficiency by 40%. So they use 40% less energy to uh, heat the mash tun because they can just use the waste energy from the distillation. And that is incredible. 40% is quite a lot for such a process. Yeah, so there is a bit of environmentalism and a bit of sustainability going on here at Glen Glenmore. And with the 24% intermediate spirit, we're going off to a whole new uh, distillery building. I think they're the old buildings. And we have a look how the, the character of the new make spirit here at Glenmore is defined. So the spirit stills here at uh, Glenmore are very, very interesting. First of all, this here is the old still house and the old distillery. When you walk through there from the, the wash stills to here, then you see uh, a lot of tanks, the old wash bags. Some of them are being reused for intermediate stills, but yeah, they were really small and it was a small distillery. They started off with two stills and then expanded up to four stills back in time when Horst was visiting the distillery. And then they built in two more stills, so expanded to six, and now they build in the three new wash stills and all of the stills are converted to spirit stills. So be careful, this one is a red one and it has a watch glass somehow, somewhere around here, but it's not a wash still, it's a spirit still. Yeah, so let's talk a bit about the spirit that is being produced at Glenmore. And the style is, it's pretty odd because um, I told you it's sweet and space side stereotype. It's typical, but it's a very straight and flat still. So you'd rather expect to have a, a very rough and rich taste uh, in the style, but it isn't. It's fruity 
and sweet because it's um, because they they distill really slow. So they didn't heat it up that fast, so the alcohol has time to separate and really create a, a fine distillate. However, it's not as fine, only fine, but it's also oily. Usually you have reflux. Here you have nearly no reflux at all. There are no vortexes in there. So the heavier parts can also rise to the tops. And the heavier parts are usually the oily stuff. And everything that reaches the top gets into the line arm and the line arm is falling. So everything that condenses in the line arm just flows right into the condenser, not back into the pot. So this gives you a, a very oily, fruity and sweet spirit. Yeah, it's a, it's a strange situation that you have a, a flat and straight uh, pot still with a very slow distillation. You don't find that very often. So, in the end, the distillery has six spirit stills with all of them nearly at the capacity of 8,000 liters. And you end up with a spirit of 69% ABV, which is not that high. And they vary the, the ABVs a bit if they change from normal malt to peated malt because it's, it just produces a bit of a different spirit. Yeah. So, yeah. This is it with the distillation, a very strange distillation and a bit atypical, but uh, it produces a very, very interesting raw spirit. Let's find out how that is turned into whiskey in the warehouse. I'm standing here in one of the Dunwich warehouses of Glenmorey, and it's a beautiful sight. You have casks stored up to only three rows high, and if it's the big sherry butts, then we only have two rows high. It's stamped, earthy floor. It's pretty cold and damp in here, so the perfect, perfect climate for Scotch malt whiskey to mature. And um, let's talk a bit about the, the warehouses here. They can store up to 135,000 casks on site. They're building two new warehouses to get up to 185,000 casks on site. And in terms of maturation, most of uh, the spirit is first filled into bourbon casks. Ex-bourbon casks that come from America. This here comes from uh, Kentucky and was at uh, Jim Beam. And um, it gives the the whiskey uh, a light vanilla flavor and just a mild flavor because it's American white oak. And American white oak is, is pretty mild and pretty sweet and yeah, just, just nicely done. 80% um, go into these bourbon casks and 20% go into other casks that are solely matured in other casks. And the distillery was one of the first distilleries that introduced casks finishing. So you take a cask that has a, a bourbon cask that has matured for 12 years, then you take it out and you finish it for another period of six months, two years in other casks. Let's have a look at these other casks, what, what there is. Um, here are a few experiments. And uh, the first experience is a Scottish ale cask finish uh, from transfer 2017. So mm, pretty wild. And then we have a cider cask finish uh, from transfer 2015. They changed the law that they are actually allowed to do the, the uh, cider cask finish or cask maturation. Not quite sure when that was. I was pretty sure that was after 2015. So if you, if you know about the Scottish uh, legislation for maturing whiskey, then feel free to write it in the comments. Um, then we have one that is really famous for, for Glen Murray. It's the Porto. Yeah, the port, port wine. And the port wine gives it a, a fruity touch. But still, port wine is not port wine. There are three distinctive types of port wine. We have the sweet, dry, and medium. And this is probably always the, the sweet one. The sweet one is always the, the most fruity and yeah, sweet whiskey. Uh, Madeira, we had a nice um, <coughs> single cask for Whiskey or D, or German uh, store in 2019. That was, was really nice, but the, uh, I've heard that the Madeira is um, yeah, 
coming pretty soon as uh, what do you call it, uh, standard edition, or they will do a lot more with the Madeira cask finish in the future. And then we have a rum cask. The company, the mother company of, um, of Glenmorey, they also do have rum distilleries in the, not overseas colonies, but, but the overseas territories from the French states. So yeah, France does have some territory within the Caribbean and South America. So this is where the, the rum is being made from that French mother company. Then we have something very unusual. The typical Glenmorey is not peated. This year is peated and also it's in Fino sherry. The sherry also has a lot of types of sherry. We have the very sweet Pedro Chimines. Then we have the Oloroso, which is nutty, fruity. Sometimes you confuse it with sweet, actually not sweet, but kind of feels like sweet. And then you have the fino. The fino is very different because it's, it's dry and some people call it soapy. And yeah, it's, it's very different. It's, it's not a fruity because it's fully through fermented, fermented <coughs> sherry. So peated with fino, that's, a, that's probably a really strange Glenmorey. And then we have my favorites, the wine cask finishes. Yeah, we have a uh, Sauterne, uh, Bordeaux, Burgundy and a Sauterne. So these are pretty famous um, types of wines and <coughs> you can always spot the wine cask uh, with these wooden hoops or rings around them. Not quite sure why they use them, but I was told that the, the woodworms that eat the, the wood they tend to go for the softer wood first. So if you have these rings around them, then here you can see there's always some woodworm in there. And maybe the, the wine wineries have problems with these woodworms. And so they do a bit of like a distraction or not, not a trap, but a distraction. So they eat the, the ring first and leave the cask untouched so it doesn't leak. Yeah, back there we still have some cognac or some uh, other sherries in there. So there's a lot of experimenting going on. There's a lot about the cask finishes going on. And if you'd like to know more about uh, what's going to happen, I will have an interview and I will ask them how, yeah, how they're going to develop their portfolio in the future. So stay tuned. We're going to have some of the Glenmorey uh, core range and I'm going to ask some questions to someone at, uh, from the distillery. So that was it with the production and now we're having a little tasting plus a bit of an interview. I'm standing here with Ian Allen. You've already 18 years in the business, yes. experience with whiskey and you're the Visitor Center Manager and Global Brand Ambassador. Yes. Thank you very much for having us here. Thank you for showing us around through the distillery. It's a lovely place. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been my pleasure and uh, thanks for joining us here in warehouse number one at Glen Murray Distillery for little mm -hmm. introduction to some of our whiskies that we have. So, so what are we having today? That, that sounds really, really interesting. Yeah, so we've taken a bit of a, a kind of brief snapshot through our different selections of whiskies and we've chosen from our classic range, uh, we've got the Glen Murray Classic Port Cask finish. Mm -hmm. And this is part of a range which we've been developing over the years. We introduced uh, a peated expression into the, the equation as well. Uh, more recently, we've taken the Cabernet cask out. But the, one of the first ones we did uh, was the port cask finish mm -hmm. and I think it's a, a great choice from the classic range for us to open mm -hmm. up our tasting with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let, let's yeah, have let's some. Let's get stuck in. So, uh, oh. Oh, crap. Oh. so <laughs> always with a port cask we can always tell you know the lovely colour that the port provides into the whiskey. So it's, it's natural colour? This is natural colour, yes. Oh, so this is coming is. from Tawny Port Casks from Porto Cruz. So uh -huh. the company that owns Glen Murray also owns the port producer. So we have a uh, great provenance of where the casks come from. Mm -hmm. uh, and we only need to give it eight months of a finish. Eight months finish. Eight months finish. So what mm -hmm. we've got is a whiskey which has spent uh, most of its life in bourbon casks. Oh. Uh, it's a mixture of ages. The average is about six years old. Mm -hmm. uh, so time in the bourbon cask before being transferred into the Tawny Port cask to pick up just a light influence of the port. You know, it's not really too overpowering. Mm -hmm. uh, you get it on the nose, that lovely kind of fruity, mm -hmm. uh, slightly sweet characteristic coming through. A lot of red mm -hmm. berry within the port Yes, finish. It's, it's fresh with, with berries and, and a nice wine aroma. So is a port 
Porto is still a fortified wine, right? Yes, yes. Oh, so we've got that kind of stronger fortified wine influence. One mm. of my colleagues uh, refers to this as our barbecue dram. You know, it's a great summer whiskey <laughs> okay. for taking out and sharing with friends who, who may not normally drink whiskey because this is just such a wonderfully accessible dram. Mm -hmm. uh, nice and easy drinking, a lot of fruit notes, uh, just a, a perfect... Mm. Uh, you know, summer drink, yeah. which in Scotland <laughs> is not, not many days of the year, to be fair. So if we go to taste it, it carries on through with that yep. lovely freshness. So Slange. Slange. Mm. So the Glen Murray spirit always brings a lovely kind of creaminess to it. So that still overrides. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what type of cask mm -hmm. we put it in. You get a lovely creamy mm -hmm. vanilla note. And then that slightly kind of tannic chocolate characteristic on the finish of this whiskey. Mm -hmm. It's really strange that you can have such a, a fresh fruity combined with yeah, creaminess, oiliness. Yep. Is that the one that, that you have uh, the, the straight uh, stills with a slow distillation that you get these this oiliness is that yeah so we we have these uh, that's the distillery character that's the distillery's DNA oh, okay. you know that is the base characteristics we have these very short stills mm -hmm. the line arms are at quite a low level so it always brings that oiliness of character through mm -hmm. with it um, and it shines through well, it doesn't matter which of our whiskies we do mm -hmm. that always seems to come to the fore in mm -hmm. all of our products. I love it. The warehouse number one you said is We're here. Warehouse yeah. number one, yes. Um, I've seen a lot of cask finishes around here. So, are you thinking about expanding the range in the future? At I, all? Well, watch this space. It's an interesting time for <laughs> Glen Murray. Uh, we've just taken on board uh, Kirsty McCallum, mm -hmm. uh, who's joined the company as our head of whiskey creation. Mm -hmm. So, it's going to bring a fresh new look to, to Glen Murray. And she'll be spending some time over the coming weeks going through our stocks, you know, nosing and sampling casks, mm -hmm. looking for interesting gems and, and what she sees as the future of Glen Murray. So uh, at the moment, uh, you know, we've got a great range, a great selection of whiskies. Mm -hmm. uh, the future will bring something different, something new. So we have to hold tight and see what happens. Uh, okay, so it's, it's unclear, but we can expect something. I would say so. I would say. <laughs> I, I'd be disappointed if we weren't looking at something in the future. Yeah. Okay, interesting. So um, what else we got? So, yeah, so the second dram we've got, uh, we move from our classic range, which is the, the collection of non-age mm -hmm. statement whiskies, and we move on to our heritage range. And the first one we have, for me, I always think the 12 year old is flagship Glen Murray. You know, this mm -hmm. this is the one which showcases the, the distillery's spirit style along with the kind of more typical wood policy, which is bourbon matured. Mm -hmm. So uh, within, the, the, within the 12 year old, there's no finishing, just straight 12 years maturation in bourbon casks or American whiskey barrels. Okay, so it's 12 years bourbon. 12 mm -hmm. years, yes. Mm. So it, it's, it's just that lovely kind of balance, roundness of character. And it's, for me, the 12 year old is Speyside in a glass. <laughs> you know, this kind of Speyside characteristic of sweet and spice, mm -hmm. I think come to the fore perfectly with the 12 year old. Mm -hmm. you know, you're getting that lovely, sweet, creamy vanilla note, which is that Glen Murray spirit style into the bourbon cask. You get this lovely little hint of ginger spice on the finish. Mm -hmm. It's spicier than I ever expected. Yep. I love the the oily t touch that you have, that character that just comes through. Yes. Mm, I love it. Mm. Really didn't didn't have that when, when you not visited the distillery. So yeah. it's always a different experience when you visit a distillery and, and you have some whiskey at the distillery. Yes. It's, it's just a, a lovely time. So I've seen, I, I like the style of the bottles. You have a lot of, yes. uh, it's, it's, it looks really cool and you have your, your logo on top. Yep. Uh, it still has the ship there. Yes. Um, do you still ship the whiskey through Lossy Mouth? I, I, unfortunately not. <laughs> Lossy Mouth doesn't give us the uh, connection with the rest of the world that it once used to. Uh, now, a lot of our exports are going by ship. Uh, they'll ship from Grangemouth. Our bottling is done down in Bathgate, kind of mm -hmm. uh, part way through mm -hmm. from Glasgow and Edinburgh. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, everything will make its way from ship there. So we're still using ship, still traditional <laughs> method of getting our whiskey out to the rest of the world. Mm, so. mm. 
Not from so there is not, not a small steamship here? Yeah. There's not a small steamship. <laughs> we may need to look at that in the future. So uh, uh, bringing, bringing old school back to shipping. So Lossiemouth is more like a fishing town now? Uh, well, no, the fishing has moved away. It's much more of a kind of, uh, kind of sporting and kind of relaxation, shipping and boating and yachting and things like that. So, so you're from around here, right? I am, yeah. So born and bred in Elgin. So yeah, so I moved away briefly, but came back, back to, to be involved in the whiskey industry. Oh, okay. So nice. Okay, yes. so you, you know your way around the Lossy Mouth. A little bit, yeah. It only takes a couple of days to know your way around Lossy Mouth. It's not a big time. I love it. I love it. Okay, so, so this was 100% uh, uh, maturation. Yes. Now the 15 is a bit more complex, or yeah. So the 15 were being a little bit more uh, kind of you know playful in what we do to some extent. What we've got is a mixture of bourbon and cherry cask. So we're using the two casks like we did with the port cask, but, but this time instead of taking it from one and putting it into the other, mm -hmm. we're maturing for 15 years in bourbon or American whiskey casks, and 15 years in cherry casks, and then prior to bottling at the marrying stage, we're combining the two together. Oh, so it's a combination of different casks. Yes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So that allows um, for two different flavor styles mm -hmm. to kind of marry together in mm -hmm. the final bottling. Okay, very nice, very nice. And that, what, what is the marriage? It's between bourbon casks and... and sherry casks. Sherry casks. Yes. So okay. we're using Oloroso sherry casks and American whiskey casks. Oloroso. And it's a, it's a straightforward 50-50 split. 50-50 split, 50 /50. okay. So you've got 50% sherry, 50% bourbon. Uh, the introduction of the sherry brings a whole new different kind of flavor characteristics. It was kind of dried fruit, chocolatey mm -hmm. notes. For me, the 15 is the sweetest of the Glen Murray range. And, and although sweetness runs through all of our whiskies, I think the 15 really brings it to the fore. Mm -hmm. So you get those kind of slightly more dried fruits coming through with the sherry, but you've still yeah. got that backbone mm -hmm. of that vanilla toffee-like characteristic. Mm -hmm. There is the a lot of, lot of vanilla in there, but yep. also is a bit of a, yeah, it's a bit more settled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like it. Yeah, the 15 is a great whiskey. Uh, and if we taste it. Mm. <laughs> A bit more texture, a bit more depth, and uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more character coming through. Mm. That combination of the two, neither seems to take over. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes with sherry, it can be the bigger flavor, but here you've got mm -hmm. the balance between the two, creating this slightly kind of mocha chocolatey note coming through into the whiskey. Oh, I like it. I like it. What, what I really like is you have the complexity between the, this melt between the, the two cars, but you still. Now that I have the distillery character and I know how it was created, yep. it really follows me through the whiskey. Yes, <laughs> it is. And you know, so my, my Glen Murray experience for um, tasting whiskey is not the same anymore. No, it's changed. Uh, hopefully yeah. for the better. Uh, so what we got, you always find that the Glen Murray spirit character, mm -hmm. regardless of what type of cask we do, even when we use peat through the, throughout the production, it still has this DNA, this mm -hmm. baseline flavor. This mm. seems to cut through at any age in any cast type. I love it. It's an oily, peaty whiskey. Okay, that, that I love it. I love it. Mm -hmm. So um, the the cast that I showed before in the in the in the take with the in the scene with the warehouse has a lot of really <laughs> really interesting cast. There's a, a cider cask finish uh, distilled 2005, transferred 2015. Yep. So um, I know they changed the legislation in the recent past. When did they actually let you do the, the cider cask finish? Well, they, they haven't. Uh, well, the, the legislation <laughs> changed, but not enough to allow us to introduce cider cask into the equation, sadly. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. so we did have a release uh, last year, uh, which unfortunately for the time being will be our last release of cider until there's another change in the foreseeable future, hopefully in this future. So, so when, when you release it, uh, you're not allowed to call it Scotch whiskey or whiskey? Yeah, or so, so um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know what the plans are for these casks. Uh, we'll maybe sit on them and hope that there's another cycle of legislation change. Uh, but if we don't get to that, then yeah, ultimately, if you are looking for an avenue for it, you wouldn't be allowed to call it Scotch whiskey. It would be a cider cask spirit or something like that. Cider cask yeah. spirit. <laughs> we could, could create a whole new category. <laughs> <laughs> okay, interesting, interesting. <laughs> so you have a cask where you're not quite sure not what you're doing sure. with it. No, it'll sit here, it'll sit quietly, nobody will but touch it. You're allowed to serve it to, to, uh, to tourists? 
I know, because the tax man, the duty, hasn't been oh, paid okay. on it, so we can't uh, be dishing it out yet. Uh, yet uh, <laughs> oh yeah, the tax man is uh, not uh, concerned uh, about what you call it, but what you pay. What we pay, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now we're going a bit into the older range. Yeah, huh? absolutely. So we're going to finish up with uh, our 18-year-old. Mm -hmm. uh, a personal favourite of mine. I really love our 18-year-old. Uh, what we've got here is a whiskey within the core range, which we uh, have non-chill filtered. So it's bottled at that higher ABV as a result. So this is 47.2%. So there's a little bit more intensity to what we have here. Mm -hmm. For me, the 18 has, has got the, the baseline characteristics of the 12, but we really crank the volume up on them. It becomes more intensified and more, mm -hmm. more of a powerful whiskey at 18 years old. Mm -hmm. Does the, the, the distillery character Usually when you have a, a, a whiskey and you have the cask maturation, the distillery character kind of fades away and the, the cask character takes over. Does that happen with the oiliness as well? No, that, that remains, especially when we're bringing this out at non-chill filtered. Uh, that will help to accentuate that and brings mm -hmm. more of it to the table, if anything. So this is a whiskey with a real thickness and viscosity, mm -hmm. a texture that feels velvety on the palate, as well as bringing you know, that, that more spicy characteristic that's expected mm -hmm. with something of 18 years of maturation. Okay, good. Mm. And, you know, enjoying whiskey is, is, is a pleasure, but to mm. do it in a warehouse, uh, there's no better place than having <laughs> something that's spent 18 years sitting, maturing around us here, mm. uh, is something enjoyable. It really affects the, the tasting if you have it in a warehouse. Absolutely, it's just, yes. Mm. Ooh, when you said spicy, yeah, this, is, this is, has a good amount more kick to it. Absolutely. You know, mm. this brings so much more to the table. You know, Ooh. after 18 years, you'd expect more flavor, but with that added non-chill filter and process from it, it brings more character into the whiskey. And it's just, it's just American oak? Yes. So we're doing similar to the 12-year-old, but this time, because of this higher ABV, we're bringing 100% first fill. So oh, with, okay. within the 12, we're using first, second, and third. Mm -hmm. So that brings the softness and lightness here. We want to bring all the character we can into the whiskey. Oh, okay, nice. I like it, it's, but it's a bit different to the others. So this is, mm, this is a bit going f further away from the space side character. I would say it's, it has is is really a bit rich and a bit demanding. I would say. Yeah, it's it's and certainly bit, it's, yeah exciting. We we want the range to be varied. Mm -hmm. You know, we will have mm -hmm. this common thread, but we wanted to bring something a little bit mm -hmm. different each time. And the eighteen certainly steps up to the mark. Mm. I was about to say that you don't have a. A very mm, ordinary line. You, you have a lot of variation in there. There's a, a big difference between this and this. Yes. There's, a, there's like like day and night where this is like mild, fresh, fruity. This one is rich and even powerful, I would say. And yeah. mm, I like it. I like it. So nice. yeah. Thank you very much for showing me this. Uh, my pleasure. Beautiful core range. And yeah, thank you very much for showing us around and giving our viewers the chance to find out what Glenmorey is all about. Excellent. I hope they enjoyed as much as I did looking after you guys. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, and if you like this video and you have friends who might also be interested in the Glenmorey distillery, then please feel free to share this video with these friends. And see you next time.